Good morning or good afternoon, actually. I'm Nancy Tawana, Director of the Rock Ethics Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third of our lectures in our Health as a Human Right lecture series. And um, welcome, and also invite you to join us at the end of the month on November 28th, when Dr. David Himmelstein from Harvard Medical School will be giving a talk on health care reform, a medical emergency which will be the last of the lectures for the fall semester. The lecture series will start up again in the spring, so keep an eye out for the exciting lectures that we're bringing through. We developed this lecture series in order to give us all the opportunity to think about what it means to talk about health as a human right. And there are multiple meanings of that term that different speakers have talked about in different ways. The most obvious one is whether or not we, in the United States as well as globally, should be thinking about health in the same way we think about life, liberty, and the pursuit of justice, namely as a right that we vest in individuals and make sure is supported by our country, which would mean equitable access to health care but it would also go beyond health care because it would also mean attention to public health issues, in particular attention to whether or not there are groups of people who are particularly um, privileged or denied privileges concerning environmental health issues. So we're attentive to the ways in which um, environmental racism snakes through health issues, as well as issue, the impact of poverty on health, an issue that was brought to our attention most recently with the uh, hurricanes Katrina and then Rita following behind her. So we urge you to use this lecture series as an opportunity to think about how we should be thinking about health in this country and to think about how you as a citizen and as a voter might want to make an impact on making sure that if health is a right that we ensure that all citizens of our country have that right as well as thinking about what we can do globally. The importance of this lecture series is reflected in the number of um, co-sponsors that have made it possible, and I just beg your um, attention for one minute while I read a relatively long list. This series is made possible by support from Richard and Ronnie Lippin, the Arthur W. Page Center for Integrity and in Public Communication, the Center for Healthcare and Policy Research, the Center for Human Development and Family Research in Diverse Contexts, Children, Youth, and Families Consortia, the Department of Biobehavioral Health, the Department of Health Policy and Administration, the Department of Sociology, the Gerontology Center, Penn State College of Medicine's Department of Humanities, the Penn State Pre-Med Program, the School of Nursing, and the University Libraries. All of the events sponsored by the Rock Ethics Institute are also made possible with the support of a generous gift from Doug and Julie Rock. As you can see from our long list, there are many people here at Penn State who think that this topic is an important one, and I appreciate the time that you're giving to thinking it through today. I would like to introduce Jennifer Mensch, the Assistant Director of the Rock Ethics Institute, who will introduce our speaker today. Okay, so it's with great pleasure that I have this opportunity to introduce Dr. Vanessa Northington Gamble to you. She is currently the director of the Tuskegee Universe, University Nash, National Center for Bioethics and Research in Ethic and Healthcare. Um, Dr. Gamble has a PhD degree in History and Sociology of Science and an MD degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, her career includes stints as director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in Medicine and as a tenured associate professor of the History of Medicine, the History of Science, and Family Medicine at the University of Wisconsin Medicine School of Medicine. The University of Wisconsin Madison School of Medicine. She was also recently elected to the Institute of Medicine. Um, Dr. Gamble was a resident physician at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, and she has written more than 25 articles and chapters and books. She has also written or edited three books, 
um, including the Black Community Hospital, Contemporary Dilemmas and Historical Perspectives, Germs Have No Color Line, Blacks in American Medicine, 1900 to 1940, and Making a Place for Ourselves, The Black Hospital Movement, 1920 to 1945. And this book, Making a Place for Ourselves, was named an outstanding academic book in 1995 by The Choice Magazine. This last book, uh, Making a Place for Ourselves, is a book where Dr. Gamble seeks to investigate the development of black hospitals during the period 1920-1945 before the civil rights era and she examines the ways in which that was ideologically um, uh, ideologically difficult within the black community itself at the same time that it was critical for the, the development of black doctors that those hospitals were necessary for them for their professional development um, in the words of one reviewer uh, broadly speaking, making a place for ourselves clearly and powerfully documents how issues of race and racism have affected the development of the American hospital system and the American health care system. And as you'll see uh, from today's talk, these are issues which have affected and had an ongoing influence in Dr. Gamble's career as a, as a researcher, as a doctor, and as a political activist. So thank you very much. Um, and join me in welcoming her, please. Thank you for such a gracious introduction. I just want to add a couple of things. I'm a native of West Philadelphia, and the last time I was at Penn State was when I was in college. And let's put it this way. I would not think I would be standing here today talking about some of the issues given my undergraduate career. So uh, I think there's a future for all of us uh, in terms of what we do. And I'm really very happy to be here, and I want to thank you for in inviting me. And what I'd like to talk about today is looking at issues of health disparities, bioethics, and justice. The Institute of Medicine put out this book last, uh, in 2002 called Unequal Justice, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare. And I'm gonna talk some more later about this report. But one of the things that I want you to think about as I give my lecture is that many times in the United States we talk about health care as a right, that the need there is a need for a national health system so that people could have health insurance. What this unequal treatment report did showed that for racial and ethnic minorities in this country, even those who have health insurance, that there is inequalities in terms of the care that they get. So when we talk about health as a human right, we need to talk even more broadly than access to insurance. More specifically, what I'd like to, I have three broad goals today. The first is to provide an, a historical overview of racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, to, why, to explain why these issues are a bioethics issue, and to discuss what bioethicists can do to address these disparities. Now, what are health disparities? You know, being a teacher, I always like want to make sure we're all on the same page. One of the problems about health disparities are there's no standard definition. And since there's no standard definition, how one agency might use the term is in the federal government is very different than how another agency uses it. So that, that has implications for our research and our policy and how we monitor uh, success or lack of success. I'm also going to make a distinction as we go on, on between disparities in health and disparities in health care, and also make a distinction between the terms health disparities and health inequities. Now, first, let's start out with some definitions of what are health disparities. This definition from health, of health disparities comes from the National Institutes of Health. And it basically says the differences in the incidence, prevalence, mortality, death, and burden of diseases and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific population groups in the United States. And I'm gonna have some examples in, uh, shortly. The Institute of Medicine report, which I showed you the picture of uh, in the beginning of my talk, the, the picture of the cover, 
that racial or ethnic disparities in the quality of health care that are not due to access related issues, meaning that it's not it's that that one might have health insurance or that one um, has uh, can go to a doctor, but they're not related to access related issues or clinical needs or preferences, meaning that the patient had a, per, a particular preference. Here's another one from the federal government. A population specific difference in the presence of disease, health, health outcomes, or access to care. So, I mean, all of these definitions point to differences, but what they uh, emphasize are, are a bit different. I always like to make a distinction between disparities in health versus disparities in health care. This here is a disparity in health. And this is a grim reaper coming to a black man saying, you'll be happy to know that race played no part in this decision. Now, the reason I show this cartoon is that those of us who do work on looking at racial and ethnic disparities in health and health care know that race does have a play a part when the Grim Reaper comes. We, the Grim Reaper will come for all of us. We will all die. That's basically what I'm saying. But for groups of people in this country, they die sooner than other groups of people. Let's go to some examples here, which are disparities in health. And when I'm talking about disparities in health, I'm talking about differences in such as death rates and disease rates. African-American men have a 40% higher heart disease rate than white men. Another one, women of Vietnamese origin in the United States suffer from cervical cancer at nearly five times the rate of white women. I want to focus on women of Vietnamese origin in the United States because it increases once Vietnamese women come to this country. So something happens to Vietnamese women when they come to this country. There's some studies that have shown that Mexican immigrants, the longer they stay in this country, their health status gets worse. So we have to also figure out what turn out when we talk about disparities, what's going on here in this country and whether there's some traditional health practices that groups of people have that they lose once they come to this country. Native Americans have a diabetes rate that is nearly three times the rate of whites. And the Hispanic rate is nearly double that of whites. And the Native American diabetes rate is even increasing in younger Native Americans. So, the, and, and actually in this morning's USA Today, there was a, an article talking about preventive measures to help young uh, Native Americans. And African American women are 28% more likely to die from breast cancer, although the incidence is greater in white women. That means white women get breast cancer more than black women, more frequently than black women, but black women die from it. So the question is, why is that? Is it because black women might not have access to screening uh, mammograms? Is it the biology of the tumor? We don't know. But these are all these four examples are examples of racial and ethnic disparities in health. Now let's talk about disparities in health care. The disparities in health care mean that there that people different people of different racial and ethnic groups use have uh, used uh, access have access to services that are much different than uh, other groups of people. And that there's a growing evidence in this country uh, that there's differences in treatment by race, ethnicity, and gender once a person enters the healthcare system. So someone might have health insurance, but when they get there because of their race or gender, they might be treated in a different way. Now, this today I'm going to be focusing on racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. And by focusing on ethnic and racial disparities in healthcare, I'm not saying that there aren't different types of disparities in this country. There are dis disparities based on where you live, whether you live in a rural area as opposed to an urban area. There are disparities uh, in terms of, um, uh, of income. But today, I'm going to be focusing on racial and ethnic disparities in, in, in healthcare. And the reason why I think those of us as citizens of this country need to be aware 
aware of these disparities is that because of these disparities, people die. People are sick, some groups of people are sicker than others, and that, and that these differences in treatment are related to differences in outcome. Health disparities versus health inequities. In the United States, we talk about health disparities, meaning that there is a difference. Most of the world talks about either health inequities or health inequalities. I personally prefer the term health inequities. Why do I prefer the term health inequities? Because for me, that focuses something's wrong. It's unequal. It's unjust, as opposed to a disparity, which can be different, which just means a difference. And as I said, most of the world talks about health inequities. But we in this country talk about health disparities. And since we're talking about the context of the United States, I want to talk, use the language of the United States. So I will use the, the term of uh, health disparity. And, and the reason why I prefer, another reason why I prefer the term inequity is that you see that, that, that it, it means it's an equal, unequal. So that means that there's something wrong with that. But as I said, We'll talk about disparities because that's the language of the United States. When the Institute of Medicine report came out in March of 2002, it really put disparities on the map in the United States in terms of the Institute of Medicine, which is this prestigious body, said we have a problem in this country. But being a historian, I always like to point out this is not the first time that we in this country have talked about disparities. It's been over a hundred years that we've tried to, to talk about this, but so why, what's gonna make it different this time? So a lot of times when I go around today talking about it, I said, yes, we know disparities exist. What are we going to do about it? So I want to go back to talk about this historically. In 1906, W.E.B. Du Bois, who was an African-American social, social scientist, put out a book called The Health and Physique of the Negro American. And what he did in this book was to show that African-Americans had a poor health status compared to white Americans. And he also emphasized in this book that it was the social conditions of African Americans that led to this poor health status. Now, why was this important in 1906? This was important in 1906 because it was after the Civil War. And in the Reconstruction period that followed the Civil War, there were texts, there were medical journals that said that African Americans were biologically inferior to white Americans. And because they were biologically inferior to white Americans, that led to their poor health status. So for example, there were in, in the public health journals, physicians writing that they had never seen a case of tuberculosis in an African American during slavery. So the question is, why? Now one person thought, since he had never seen, and this was in a medical text, since he had never seen a case of tuberculosis in an African American during slavery, he suggested that slavery be reinstituted to help the health status of African Americans. Not a lot of people went for that. But the point was that there was like, well, you know, something's different in African Americans. What maybe they had smaller lungs. You know, maybe they had smaller brains. This was all in the medical literature. What Du Bois said was, if you put a white American in the same social conditions, in the tenements, if you, had, if you put white Americans it, with the same jobs, they too would have poor health status. And that what he argued was that there needed to be research to find out the reasons why African Americans had poor health status. But he also emphasized that you just can't study, that you have to act. So this was in 1906. In 1915, there started at Tuskegee something called National Negro Health Week. And this was a campaign that the African-American community started 
to call attention to the high disease morbidity and the high mortality death rates in African Americans and to develop plans to attack them. That there needed to be something, so that, once again, there needed to be not just documentation, there needed to be action. And Booker T. Washington said, without health, it will be impossible for us to have permanent success, meaning African Americans in business, in property getting and in acquiring education without health and long life, all else fails. Now, Booker T. Washington was a bit more elegant than I put it several years ago. Several years ago, when I was on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin, there was a conference on looking at African American studies. And um, when you're a moderator, you can take over the microphone and do whatever you want. So what happened was they had everything, you know, education, criminal justice, everything, but they didn't have anything on health. So since I was moderating the, uh, the panel, I took the prerogative of talking about health because I said, if you're sick, dying, and dead, or dead, nothing else matters. So, but as I said, Booker T. Washington said it a bit more eloquently than I did. And what was National Negro Health Week? It started in 1912 in Virginia, where the National ne uh, Negro Business League started a week where African Americans would focus on health. There were, there were lectures in schools, there were sermons about health, and then it was moved to 1915 uh, and, and when Booker T. Washington moved it to Tuskegee. It used to be uh, the, uh, the, week, the second week in April every year, which is Booker T. Washington's birthday. And it, by, between 1915 and 1930, there were activities in 32 states. So this was a grassroots African-American-led uh, campaign to improve health status because African-Americans realized that they had poorer health status than white Americans. In 1930, the government took it over. The United States Public Health Service took over operations of the National Negro Health Week. Why did the government took, take it over? Tuskegee wanted the government to take it over because they felt that if the government acknowledged that the health status of African Americans was poor and wanted to do something about it, that things would be done. In 1932, the Public Health Service established the Office of Negro Health Work. It was the first time since after the Civil War where there was a concentrated office in the federal government that looked at health care issues in the African American community. This office was dismantled in 1950. The black community pushed for the dismantlement of the office. Why did the United States, why did the African American community push for this dismantlement of an office that looked at uh, Negro health work? It wasn't because the health status of African Americans had improved so greatly, but it was because they felt that there should not be a segregated office. There should not be a separate office that looked at Negro health that they felt that it should be the responsibility not just of one office within the federal government, but that it should be the responsibility of several offices within the, the, the federal government to look at uh, uh, black health issues. So the office was dismantled in 1950. In the introduction, it was mentioned that I had written a book on looking at uh, black hospitals. And one of the things that when I first started working uh, on that project was the number of people who were amazed that there were black hospitals, that there were segregated hospitals in this country, that people were not allowed into the hospitals even if they had been in a car accident. And this was not a Southern phenomenon. It also happened in places in the North where if the African American woman would come to particular hospitals in active labor, that she would not be allowed in the hospital, that she would have to deliver her baby outside. Or that if an African American were in a car accident, bleeding all over the place, that he might not be admitted because, only because of the color of their skin. So a large part of the efforts to improve the health status of African Americans was to 
desegregate hospitals, to allow African Americans to go it, to be to be admitted to hospitals not, you know, be, to be admitted to hospitals. And so that there was a medical civil rights movement in this country to allow African Americans access to hospitals. And as was true of the civil rights movement in general, it was a multi-pronged process. There was grassroots activism, meaning there were, there, there were uh, sit-ins in front of hospitals. There was demonstrations in front of hospitals. Also, the black church was really active in trying to paint the picture that this was morally wrong. That in the United States, we are not a country where someone is denied access to health care only because of the color of their skin. Now, we have to ask ourselves today whether being a moral country, whether someone is denied access to health care because of uh, because they don't have insurance. And David Himmelson will talk a lot about that in, 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 in his lecture. So that there was a campaign to show this was morally wrong, that we do not do this in the United States. And many of you know about Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, which ruled that in terms of public school education, separate was not equal. That court case came in 1954. But there were also court cases seen here, Simpson, the Simpkins case and the Grubbs case, that looked at separate but equal in the context of hospitals. And they basically ruled that hospitals, especially those that were receiving federal money, could not discriminate. But not all hospitals received federal money. So it took laws such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Medicare and Medicaid Acts of 1965 to say that it was wrong to, to discriminate on the base of race, creed, or color in terms of hospitals. So we, you know, we have these differences in terms of health care. And one strategy was to get African Americans access to help to hospitals and health facilities. Now what we're grappling with, a couple of things we're grappling with now, one, to make sure that people have health insurance, and two, what happens once one gets in the doors of the health facility? In 1985, 20 years ago, during the presidency of, of, of Ronald Reagan, there is a report of the Secretary's Task Force on Black and Minority Health. And it's called the Heckler, Heckler Report because Margaret Heckler was head of the Department of Health and Human Services at that time. And this report found that there were 60,000 excess deaths that occurred each year in minority populations. Let's put it another way. 60,000 Americans died each year that who would not have died if they, if they were of another race, if they were white. So this said, okay, we need to do something about it. The primary goal of the Heckler Report was to document that there are racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. You know, that there had to be research to show that they were these particular disparities. What did the Heckler Report recommend? The Heckler Report recommended that there need to be education, research, data, and communications. They focused a lot on lifestyle, uh, communicating to, to, to folks to improve their lifestyle. The other thing that it recommended was that there needed to be, once again, an office in the federal uh, a bureaucracy that looked at minority health. So in, 19, in January of 1986, there was an establishment of the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health. Now, I mean, the report came out in the fall of 1985. The office was opened in January of 1986. Things don't go so quickly in the government. It did with the, uh, the opening of, uh, of this Office of Minority Health. I point your attention to the, the fact that this was going to be the Office of Minority Health. This was not going to be the Office of Negro Health. 
This was not going to be the Office of Black Health, but it was the Office of Minority Health. And, be, and because it was an acknowledgement that the minority population in the United States was changing and that it was no longer just a black-white issue. So that it was going to also look at minority health issues, looking at Asians, uh, Hispanics, and Native Americans. Since the publication of the, the HECFA report in 1985, there have been hundreds, hundreds of studies that have shown that there is racial and ethnic disparities in access to health care. That means that certain people are not given the same care as other folks. And it's a wide range of services. One is looks at diagnostic tests and procedures. There's studies that have shown that, uh, and, and I will take, talk a bit more about that, studies that have shown that uh, African Americans are not given the same care who, uh, our African Americans who come in with heart disease are not given the same treatment and diagnostic uh, uh, procedures as other groups of people. There's also been extensive literature looking at intensity of care, meaning if a, a Latino child comes in and has pain control, they might, it has complaints of uh, pain, they might not be given the, the, the recommended uh, uh, pain uh, medication. Also, that there is evidence of racial and ethnic disparities in terms of transplants. African Americans have a higher need for transplants because of heart of, because of heart disease and kidney disease in the African American community. They're, that they don't receive the, the same level of transplants. Now it's very complicated. One because African Americans sometimes don't give their organs for reasons that we'll talk about later. Also that African Americans uh, are, are, for religious reasons, uh, might not uh, uh, give their uh, give their organs. So that so that when I talk about these disparities, I'm not saying it's a cut dry issue. That it's 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 very uh, complex. Now, what are some of the reasons why there might be racial and ethnic disparities in access? One might be socioeconomic status, meaning education. Someone might, you know, be, have uh, have uh, have a, a, a lower education and might have lower literacy and might not be able to to understand what the physician is saying. Another is language barriers. That the the country is changing in terms of language. You know, my 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 friends who practice in California, you know, people think that you know, only thing you need to think about is English and Spanish in California. But there's all the different dialects for the, for uh, for you know Chinese, for example. So that in terms of being able to for a patient to be able to talk to a physician, insurance status that you might not have insurance or your insurance might be limited and so that that can lead to the differences in access to health care. Another is um, severity of illness. Maybe the reasons why there are differences in access is that some people have a more severe uh, illness than other and they should receive uh, 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 more care. Patient health behaviors. Maybe the patient does not want or believe what the physician is saying. That we really have to look at alternative healing practices in this country. Or that, you know, the, the patient believes that what the doctor has said is wrong. That, you know, we the doctor, and I'll say this as a physician, the doctor is not always right. The one, as you can imagine, is the hot topic, and no one wants to talk about, but I talk about it all the time, is that a possible factor might be that there's provider bias. That providers might treat different people differently because of their own biases. I'm not saying it's a lot, but it's something we have to address because we all have our issues. Several years ago, uh, someone said to me, I know it's not provider bias. 
If it is, it's only 10%. My response was, first of all, how do you know it's 10%? And is 10% acceptable? Now, one of the first groups to acknowledge that provider bias might be an issue was the American Medical Association. The American Medical Association is not known for being a liberal organization. So in 1990, the, the American Medical Association Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs said that disparities in treatment decisions may reflect subconscious bias. The healthcare system, like all society, has not eradicated this racial prejudice. So the American Medical Association is saying, just because someone has a white coat does not mean that his or her, her prejudices has been eradicated. But in 1999, a group of people that were affiliated at the time which, with Georgetown University really pushed the issue about maybe its provider bias. And this study is known as either the Georgetown study or the Shulman study named after Kevin Shulman, who was a lead author on this. And it's the, um, the effect of race and sex on physicians' recommendations for cardiac catheterization. Let me tell you what the study was about. What, what the researchers did, they recruited 720 physicians, some who were family physicians, such as myself, and some who were interns at their meetings, and asked them to take part in a study that looked at, they were told, physician, physician decision making. They recruited them by giving them a jar of Williams and Sonoma spaghetti sauce. Now, I don't know if Williams and Sonoma spaghetti sauce is any good, but some of my colleagues obviously did because in exchange for a bottle of Williams and Sonoma spaghetti sauce, they took part in the study. And what the researchers did, has anyone had it? Okay, I was just wondering how good it was. Okay. Um, what the researchers did is they took an old civil rights technique called the testing technique. And let me explain what the testing technique is. You have a black person who goes to rent an apartment. You see it in the paper. You go, you want the apartment, it's you know near campus, you really you know, think it's a great thing. You go, I'm sorry. The apartment has been rented. Five, ten minutes later, and usually the testing is done in teams of people, so they're together. So you get someone else to go short time afterwards, ask about the same apartment. Oh, come in. It's a great apartment. It was five hundred dollars. Oh no, it's four fifty for you. Um, and so that you try to catch people in the act of discriminating, that the only difference between the two people who came for the apartment was the, their race. And what, and, and what people would do uh, would also make sure that their credit reports were the same. So it didn't become an issue about economics. So what the researchers of the Georgetown study tried to do was to catch people in the act of discriminating in, in a way that, um, was not uh, uh, obtrusive. So they used, uh, as I said, a variation of the testing strategy. What they did was they had videotapes of patients. And the reason why I put patients in quotation marks on the slide is that they really were not patients. They were actors. There were people playing as patients. There were there were eight patients. Here's four here, and there's the second set there. Only difference between the patients was their race and gender. They had the same jobs. They had insurance. 
they had the same findings on their electric cardiogram. They, they also had the same labs. And what this was, these people all had symptoms of heart disease. So it's like, doctor, I have a pain right here. And given their clinical findings, these patients should have been referred for, cardi uh, for cardiac angiography to basically test to see, to see what the level of their heart blockage was. That was not done for all the patients in this group. What it showed was that for African-American women with health insurance and with the same medical findings as white and black men and, and, um, is, and with health insurance, they were 40% less likely than whites to be recommended for cardiac catheterization. So the only difference was that, they're, that they were black women. And you know you've made it when you start to be on editorial cartoons. And this is, give it to me straight, Doc. I can take, take it. What's wrong with me? You're not a white male. Now, when this study came out, I got a call from George Strait, not the country western singer, uh, George Strait, who at the time was the ABC News Network correspondent. And uh, it was in January, and I was still in Wisconsin. And the first thing he said to me was, well, you know I really want you on tape because I'm coming out to Wisconsin in January. And, and, and he wanted me to talk about the study. And one of the things that happened with the study, and it talks about the importance of having particular people in particular positions, was that it ended up on Nightline. And when it ended up on Nightline, and I, and I was on, on the Nightline with it, is that David Satcher, who at the time was a Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary of Health, said, this was the best study we have on racism. That people started talking about, we need to talk about issues of racism in American medicine. The other thing that happened after this was, I got a call from a legislator in, New legislator in New Jersey saying that this is horrible, I want to do something about it. You know, and I was very polite, so yes, that's very nice, you know, um, probably up for election, you know, whatever. Well, I must, and this was in 1999, almost six years later, that legislator has gotten legislation passed in New Jersey saying that anyone who practices medicine in New Jersey has to take classes in cultural competence to be order to take the care of people who might be different than uh, uh, to help address the issues of our becoming a more multicultural society. And it started from uh, this, this study. But what the study also did was get physicians to start talking about race. One of the things that the, the researchers said is that it's probably subconscious bias, that people don't know they might, might uh, be discriminating, but that we as a profession have to talk about these issues. Now, I mentioned David Satcher. And I think that what David Satcher, if we're talking about changing and eliminating racial and ethnic disparities in this country, we have to have strong leadership on these issues. And I think that Dr. Satcher really uh, displayed strong leadership because, first of all, he said we're going to eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. He said, we're going to eliminate disparities in healthcare based on socioeconomic status, based on geography. So that it was like, okay, we're going to do this. But also at the same time, he made it clear that in this country, that it was unacceptable. And so that the importance of having someone who is a strong moral voice on particular issues. And in 1998, President Clinton announced the Race and Health Initiative. And this is a part of his conversation on uh, a race. And that, that for these six conditions, infant mortality, the infant mortality rate in the United States for black babies is twice that of white babies. 
that you know, we had to do something about it. If you look at some of the data for Latinos, you say, well, it's not that bad for Latinos. That's for Latinos as a group. Because if you look at Puerto Ricans, it's twice that of white Americans, the infant mortality rate. Infant mortality rate is defined as the death of a baby before the first year of life. If you look at the infant mortality rate of, of, of Cubans, it's about equal that of white. So we, we also have to learn to talk about subgroups in our populations. The other thing about Mexican Americans, that, that the infant mortality rates for Mexican Americans who are first generation is lower than those who have been here later. So that issue that I talked about before of what happens when someone comes to the United States. So they looked at, wanted to look at these six conditions and to develop programs to try to, to eliminate the racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. Since the uh, recently in the change of administrations, we don't talk about the elimination of racial and ethnic disparities anymore. We talk about closing the gap. And President Clinton, in announcing this initiative, said, racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare are unacceptable in a country that values equality and equal opportunity for all. And that is why we must act now with a comprehensive initiative that focuses on healthcare and prevention for racial and ethnic minorities. These are some other things in terms of the race and health initiative. Some of the activities were partners with state and local uh, governments. When in, 19, um, in 1985, when they announced the Heckler Report, one of the other things about the Heckler Report was that each state was to have an Office of Minority Health. So there is an Office of Minority Health here in Pennsylvania. And then also to improve data collection, also to work on research initiatives within the National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the agency for healthcare research and quality. So it was not just limited in one agency of the government. And also that uh, there is a growing acknowledgement is if that is there, if there, we are going to eliminate race, race, racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, that we also have to partnership with communities. In 2000, there was something called Healthy People 2010. This comes out every 10 years. And it basically talks about what's going to be the report card uh, for the government, for the United States government, in terms of health. And it had two overarching goals. One was to increase quality and years of healthy life, and one was to eliminate health disparities. The reason I'm showing you this is to show that here we are you know, in a country where we're acknowledging that there are racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare, so what are we going to do about it? One was to have an act that elevated the Office of uh, Research on Minority Health at the National Institutes of Health to the Center for Minority Health and Health Disparities, and it mandated an annual health disparities report. The first national health disparities report came out in 2003. It was a controversy about the report. The report came out. Some of us had a copy of the report, the, the preliminary report. When the final report came out, it wasn't the same report. It had been submitted, the scientists at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality had done their job in terms of this congressionally mandated report on health disparities. It was sent to the Department of Health and Human Services where it was changed. It was changed to make it look better. It was changed to, to uh, erase some of the recommendations in terms of action on health disparities. I used to think that the term disparities was a neutral term. I told you earlier I preferred the term inequities. This report showed they erase most of the term, word disparities out of the report. They want to use the word differences. But what happens when a report is leaked and people have the original is that people put, you know, apply political power and pressure 
and the original report was released. And I, I talk about this because it's one thing to do the research, it's one thing to do the documentation, but if we in this country want to have a healthcare system where we think of healthcare as a human justice and a human rights issues, we, we're gonna to have to make sure that the people in power do the right thing. I started out with this report, Unequal Treatment, that came out, as I said, in March of 2002. And in this report, they said that disparities, there were four sources of disparities at the institutional level, at the health systems level, at the patient level, and at the clinical encounter level. Some of the institutional factors were looking at things within a broader historical and contemporary context of social and economic inequality. Um, my former colleague, Thomas Levice, at the, at the uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, says that we, were, we will not eliminate racial and uh, ethnic disparities until the health disparities folks talk with the criminal justice folks, until, until they talk with the people who look at wealth inequality and also until we talk about people who look at educational inequality. So that this is not just a medical issue, that it's a broader societal issue. And that and the Institute of Medicine also said that it was an issue around institutionalized racism. I've talked to people who are part of this, of this uh, panel, and they have said that it was eye-opening to them because they always thought it was about insurance. And what the Institute of Medicine panel did was look at, at, at studies where people were, had access to the healthcare system. So, this was, so, so these folks had health insurance. Another uh, source of disparities was health systems level factors, such as uh, financing. Certain hospitals in this country don't have the resources as other hospitals in, in this country, which also goes points to structure of care. Also, as I talked about earlier, around cultural and linguistics barriers, that if you have a hospital where most of your patients speak Spanish and you don't have any interpreters, that's gonna to lead to uh, disparities. They also talk to patient factors, patients' preferences for care, whether a patient refused the care, whether the patient adhered to the recommended um, uh, 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 treatment, whether the, and, but they, they also pointed out that poor adherence was, uh, was, was very minimal in terms of the source of disparities. Biological uh, differences, socioeconomic factors, and lifestyle choices like exercise, diet, what have you. The other thing they talked about that there were sources at the clinical encounter level, medical decision making, which the Schulman or the Georgetown study, which I showed you earlier, talked about. Lack of cultural competence, whether physicians and health providers have the skills to uh, work with people who are different than they. Uh, provider bias, and also the training and credentialing of providers in terms of dealing with a rapidly, and I really want to point out, rapidly multicultural society. But the other thing that the, the Institute of Medicine said, that racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare exist. They're not a fairy tale. And, beca and because they are associated with worse outcomes, in many cases, they are unacceptable. I would add that they are also immoral. Being a bioethicist, I would also talk about that they are immoral. And that it also, you have to look at these disparities in the broader historic and contemporary social and economic inequality. Which brings me to Hurricane Katrina. The Kaiser Family Foundation, the Washington Post, and the Harvard School of Public Health a few months ago, right after the hurricane, did a survey of evacuees at Houston area shelters. And they found that 50% of the people in the shelter had no health insurance. And that those who had health insurance, 34% of those had their health insurance covered by Medicaid, which is the federal program for some of the poor, which is being cut. Medicare, which is the federal program for the elderly and some disabled, covered 16% of those with insurance. 66% of those evacuees who used, used a hospital or a clinic as their main source of care. So they didn't have a private physician. 
And of those, 54% use Charity Hospital, which is the city hospital in New Orleans, which isn't quite there anymore. The reason why I point this out, that we have talked a lot in this country about Hurricane Katrina and um, what it represents. I think that we have to look even into the situation before the hurricane to show that these inequalities exist. Last year, I went to the World Congress of Bioethics, uh, which was held in Sydney, Australia. And one of the speakers, and the focus of the conference was on indigenous populations. And one of the speakers there, uh, who is from one of the African countries, said, justice for us is not theoretical, but experiential. So injustice for us is not theoretical, but in a, uh, but experiential. And the reason why I point this out is that sometimes people talk about theories of justice and not talking about the experiences of injustice of certain people within our society. And I think these pictures from Hurricane Katrina show some of the injustices that exist in our society. And that one of the things we have to talk about in our society, what does it mean that certain people are not only left behind, but left out? Because I think that when you talk about health disparities, that we need to talk about in terms of the context of healthcare, that certain people are left out and left behind. And Norman Daniels, who's a bioethicist at Harvard, once said, if the, and this is 20 years ago, if the glaring inequalities in access in the United States are justifiable, this is in terms of being a philosopher, it must be acceptable because general moral principles provide justification for them. There are no general moral principles that justify inequality in healthcare. And my colleague John Stone at the Bioethics Center at Tuskegee has said, these impairments in minority health violate ethical principles such as fairness, care, beneficence, do no harm, and respect for persons. I just want to give a few sentences about what I do and who I am, besides being from West Philly. Um, and that is that I, you know, I'm director of the Tuskegee University National Center for Bioethics and Research. And our mission is to promote equity and justice in health and health care. We started in 1999. I'm the second permanent director. And we are the first bioethics center dedicated to addressing bioethical issues of importance to African Americans and other underserved populations. We're the only bioethics center that's located at a historically black college and, and uh, university. And we're the only bioethics center dedicated to increasing the number of minority bioethicists. We came about because President Clinton apologized for the United States Public Health Service uh, syphilis study at Tuskegee, where 400 black men had syphilis, and the government lied to them and said that they were being treated for their syphilis, a study that went from 1932 to 1972. And in 1997, President Clinton apologized for the syphilis study. And as part of that apology, there is money given to Tuskegee University to start this bioethics center. This summer, we had a conference of black bioethicists. And we were calling it Creating a Black Agenda in Bioethics. And the reason why we did that is that there, was a there has been and continues to be a reluctance of bioethics to deal with issues of race and racism. And one of the things that came out of this conference is that those of many of us who are African American and working in, in bioethics saw social justice at the center of our work. And that the elimination of racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare is a social justice issue. The American Society of Bioethics and Humanities a few years ago did a survey which they said 
only 6% of bioethicists focused on issues of social justice. So here's is a disconnect where those of us who have worked in communities see social justice. That's why I'm a bioethicist and an activist. I'm really glad to hear you when you added the activist part because I, you know, because I don't deny that I'm a researcher, but I do research because my goal is to improve the lives of underserved people in this country. And one of some of the conference highlights that came out was that uh, that there is that racism is systematic and institutional. That we see part of our service as bio, black bioethics as a service to the black community and not to abstract principles. And that there is a need for the bio, a bioethics of the here and now. Let me explain what I mean by the bioethics of here and now. You find a lot of bioethics focusing on cutting edge technologies. I don't have a problem with that. But what I do have a problem is the amount of time, energy, and resources that go towards looking at issues around cloning and stem cell. We don't see bioethicists spending as much time talking about the immorality that the, of the infant mortality rate in this country or the immorality that there are 45 million Americans that do not have health insurance. So that there's a, that I see there's a need for what I'm calling the bioethics of the, the, the here and now. And maybe because I said that because I've never gotten into science fiction. So maybe it's just, you know, it's just me. Um, but also that we need to reject the, the, the liberal color blindness and neutrality of certain bioethics arguments. A lot of bioethics arguments go, the reasonable person would do this. Now, I don't know what a reasonable person is, who a reasonable person is. I don't know what a reasonable person does. But I can tell you that what a reasonable person does varies in terms of where one works, where one lives, and one's skin color. So, so this is some of the conference highlights. And what I'd like to... The, um, uh, talk about is in, in terms of one of the things, let me actually change that, um, is how in terms of bioethics, you know, looking at, you know, issues of morality within science and medicine and health disparities. I want to leave with an action plan. And that one, bioethics needs to be diversified. Uh, the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities did a survey of its membership a few years ago, and only 4% of its members identified themselves as being of a, a minority group. That I think that there needs to be increased attention to issues of race, ethnicity, and racism in bioethics discourse. How can you talk about racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare? You don't want to talk about race. And one, to develop a, a profession that includes understanding and action. And that comes from my, my colleague, John Stone. And to go back to what Du Bois was talking about, you need the research, but you also need, you need it combined with political activism. I think the other thing that we need to do as citizens in this country is to establish not just a political will, but a moral will to address the issues of disparities. Disparities based on race, ethnicity, whether based on whether one is urban or rural, but that we need to say as a country, this is wrong. I mean, I think that if most Americans knew the state of health uh, of, of people of color in, the, in this country, they would say, this is wrong. I think the other thing is that institutions who are working with disparities and also bioethicists that be a part of this, they need to address the disparities in the communities and institutions in which they live. I work at the National Center for Bioethics. I would not be doing my job if I did not deal with the disparities in the community surrounding the Bioethics Center. And there needs to be increased skills to work with communities. One of the things that's come out of the Bioethics Center is the Bioethics Quilt Project. And uh, I mean, and this was, uh, was started by a woman who teaches occupational therapy. And what she did, she wanted the women in Macon County, Alabama, whose relatives were part, many of whose relatives were part of the syphilis study, to tell the story. But how these, one of the ways, a traditional way of African Americans especially rural African Americans to tell a story, especially African American women, is through quilting. So there's a group of women between the ages of 55 to 95 who've gotten together to create this quilt. 
here's the quilt. And, you know, they, they talk about they, they talk about the syphilis study, but one of the things that come across very strongly is inequality, the injustice for certain groups in this country. And so I want to leave you with these words from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He said these words in 1990, 1966, when he was in Chicago at the Second National Convention of the Medical Community of Human Rights, where he was calling attention to disparities, but at the same time, he was calling for political action. When he said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health, is the most shocking and the most inhuman. Thank you very much. Because we're webcasting, when you ask questions, we need to hand you a, a mic so we can get your voice recorded for posterity and up on our website. So just raise your voices and either Jennifer or I will come and Bring one to you. Questions, comments? I find your talk uh, regarding injustice and so forth is, is as stimulating and provocative as what you wish. But also, I think you uh, kind of un uh, failed to emphasize the differences in. Uh, uh, economic factors of, of the minority populations or, you know, uh, the, the poor that are, let's say, in the white, in the white area, too. Now, you're going to, uh, for instance, though, uh, work on infant mortality and particularly that should be uh, worked on entirely for all classes of people should it not. The reason why I, you know, I did talk about socioeconomic status in terms of disparities, and I'm, I'm very happy that you pointed out infant mortality in, in terms of black women, because I think what happens sometimes, people look at that as a poverty issue. And I think one of the things that was, uh, was, uh, was brilliant about the Institute of Medicine report is that these are people who had health insurance. So that I think a lot of people will say, well, it's just class. Um, but uh, if you look at the, the surveys of the studies that have been done on infant mortality, a lot of them have been done on middle class black women. And um, Spelman graduates, I don't know how many of you know about. Are you a Spelman grad? Yes. OK, a Spelman grad, that black women who are college educated have higher infant mortality rates than white women who graduated from high school. So that it's a, it's a combination of race and class. So I'm not denying that there are issues around class, but I think a lot of times people want to talk about the class and not want to talk about the race. And so I made a calculated decision to talk about issues around, uh, around race because it's something about being black in America that one of the things that, that the studies that have looked at infant mortality has, taught, has shown us is that here are these women who have health insurance, great educations, what my grandmother would say, good job, and that they still have higher infant mortality rates. So for so that raises a question. It's something about being black in America. That's not just related to, to class. But but no, but you know, so that's why I made that, you know, that you know that that Uh, as a physician and bioethicist, could you please comment on the fact that uh, physicians, American physicians, are participating in the torture interrogations of prisoners, almost all of whom are Arabs, uh, in Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib and probably our secret detention facilities in numerous countries? I think it's wrong. I mean, I, you know, I mean, you know, it's one of those, I can't come up with like, you know, a really brilliant intellectual response. I think it's wrong. I think that that's against what it means to be 
a physician. Uh, at, the, uh, at the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities meeting, Robert J. Lipton from Yale was there, who's done some work about this, was there and talking ab about this in terms of that, how that's against our, you know, showing how that's against our ethical um, principles as physicians. I really do think it's, it's wrong. Uh, what is your view on racialized genetic research? research specifically looking for genetic differences among the ethnic groups? I have a whole talk on that one. Uh, sure, no one wants to be here. here. I mean, it, it's, you know, one of the things that's happening with the, uh, with the Human Genome Project is that it's causing us to think about what do we mean by race? that uh, if you look at definitions of race, definitions of race have, have changed. That, you know, there, you know, there used to be a time where, you know, you, you check the census report, there was something called an octoroon, which was one-eighth uh, uh, black. Um, there's also quadroon, too, one-fourth black. Um, so our definitions have changed. If you look at, even within the United States, if you look at laws about race, who is defined as black used to differ from state to state. When we talk about race, race in South Africa, race in Brazil is very different than our definitions of race. So I, I, I just say that because I think one of the things that the mapping of the Human Genome Project is forcing us to think about and talk more about is populations. That uh, what black folks are you talking about? What Latinos are you talking about? I mean, when people say, well, Latinos have X. Well, are you talking about a Cuban? Are you talking about someone? You know, I also live part of the time in Washington, D.C., where the Latinos in Washington are, are Central Americans. I do have some concerns when, you know, one of the things that's happening in racialized medicine is that some of you might have heard about this drug called Bidil. And this is a drug that is a combination of, of two drugs that have been on the market for years and years and years uh, in terms of looking at heart failure in African Americans. The question is, is this race medicine or race marketing? in terms of marketing to the, the, the black community. So I think that we can use the Genome Project to show that we are alike in more ways than we are unlike, but that to help us find out what populations that we are looking at. Now, one of the things that comes up when people start talking about the Genome Project, and I think it's a mistake to talk about it, is that the Genome Project will set, tell us race doesn't exist. Maybe race as a biological construct does not exist, but race is a very, very powerful social construct. I was quoted last year in the New York Times Magazine saying that uh, race is real. When I can't get a cab in New York City because of the color of my skin, I can't hold up my DNA and say, I'm the same as you. So that race is a very powerful social construct. And so that when we start talking about race doesn't exist at the genome level, that's not to say it doesn't exist as a social construct. Yes. Uh, do you believe that through genetic engineering, the, uh, some of the uh, problems that some of the different classes or races have, do you think that they're going to be using that as a uh, means to uh, eradicate some of the defects and things like that? Or do you think that there's going to be more of a um, ethical and, of course, uh, upheaval by using genetic engineering for that purpose? So tell me some more. So say, repeat that. I'm sorry. Um, do you see, with the, with the current curse of genetic engineering right now and the Human Genome Project, do you see uh, genetic research being more used to uh, correct some of the flaws and things like that that some some groups have, or do you see that that's there's too much of a a moral moral dilemma in that? I, th I think one of the things that in, in terms of genetic uh, research, whether it's you know um, uh, engineering, what have you, is that we have to make sure that minorities in this country one benefits from the benefit from the advances 
but two aren't burdened by the advances. And you know that and the reason why I say that that I mean I you know if a therapy comes out that would benefit African Americans or any other group. I want them to have the advantage of that. At the same time, I would not want them to be burdened in terms of saying this reinforces that a, uh, that a group of people are genetically inferior to another group, or they are so genet genetically different. So I think that we have to, you know, to balance out both. Hi. Um, Hi. I thought one of the major issues that you focused on was provider bias, mm -hmm. but you didn't address that in your action plan. And I was just wondering, you also talked about that it's, these are very deeply held, even subconscious beliefs. I was wondering how you would go about changing these. First of all, thank you for the corrective. When I do redo my slides, I will add that. Uh, but, you know, thank you very much. But, uh, I mean, the thing is, I would put that under provider, you know, education, that you know, in, in, including uh, bias and, and, and subconscious uh, uh, bias. I mean, one of the, um, I used to teach uh, an undergraduate course at the, at the University of Wisconsin which started out being a typical history of medicine class. And they would call it race, American medicine, and public health. And the reason why you know, I said it was a typical you know, history of medicine class at first was that you know, people had to know, for example, when the first black hospital was built. Of course, since I had written a book on that, they needed to know that one. Um, but also, but what, what happened with the class at the, it, at, at the encouragement of students they wanted to be able to talk about race in a safe place where people could feel they could make mistakes. And I mean, sometimes I would say something outrageous, and, you know, just to get, you know, provoke somebody and just, to, you know, and someone would say, I think that's wrong. And I wanted them to do that so they could see that, um, that it's, uh, that it was okay and that it needed uh, to be done. One of the things that some, some medical schools are talking about, you know, cultural competence. Actually, all medical schools need to talk about it now because it's one of the requirements for accreditation of medical schools. What's been very interesting is that some people don't want to talk about race. I mean, and we all, you know, or even prejudice. We all have our prejudices. I mean, some of which comes from we might not have, you know, we might not have had encounters with folks, or you know, you know, subliminal messages through the the the, the media or entertainment. But that I think that we need to deal with issues around, you know, around around bias, and it's not just the providers, because in medicine. The first person someone might see might not be a provider. It might be a receptionist at the front desk. And so that how that person treats somebody um, um, is critical. And thank you for uh, pointing out uh, that in my action plan so I can, I can change it for next time. Um, I know even in my, like minority groups, there's like socioeconomic differences among them and um my question might probably be a little biased because i am asian but i know a lot of asian people like have higher like economic status and they are probably more accepted to the majority culture so i was just wondering if they had better access to like health care compared to other minority mm -hmm. groups that are like different from us. Okay. Um, great question. I think uh, one of the things that has happened, one is that um, in terms of looking at the, the health disparities, is that so much of the data, even the Institute of Medicine report, Unequal Treatment, looked at the disparities on the black-white 
dichotomy. And that what's clear is that we need to have more information about other racial and ethnic groups so that there isn't as much data about uh, about Asian Americans in terms of disparities. It's, I you know, pointed out the one about cervical cancer. It's also true about esophageal cancer. So, that, uh, so we need to know more about other groups. But the other thing, too, is we need to know more about subpopulations. Because I think a lot of times, you know, people, you know, people, you know, people, I think, you know, a lot of times we want to be lumpers. And if we're lumpers, we'll put all Asians together. I, I worked for 10 and a half years at the University of Wisconsin Medical School. And one of the things that happened in my time there is that we got a, we got a large flux of Hmong refugees. And there, they, um, there were issues, there, you know, there, there were issues around bias. You know, um, there were also issues around poverty and uh, and differences. So that we saw that the Hmong health status was was. Uh, was not as good as some white Americans. But then the other times, I think people think of other Asian groups that have been more, you know, have, are more economically successful, but that's not true across the board and looking at Asians. Hi, we had Hi. Uh, earlier this year, we had uh, Daryl Kirsch, the head of Penn State's College of Medicine mm -hmm. uh, speak with us and he talked about uh, the healthcare system in the United States. And pretty much what I got out of the talk was that it's not sustainable and that it's like pretty much gonna be you know really uh it's gonna implode soon it's just not gonna sustain itself and uh i was just wondering as as we uh decrease the inequity and disparity of um of uh access to health care and uh, getting health care and thereby you know increasing how many people get get health care um do you have do you have any way with your plan of action to um Combine that with like our our uh, healthcare system not being sustainable as we you know since it's already not sustainable and we're increasing amount of people is there uh, anything you can suggest we do? I mean I think one of the things that that's going to be happening you know you know in terms of the healthcare system you, you see some changes already you see that there are more things that are being done uh, outside of the hospital. So you see, you know, more of a push towards uh, uh, towards uh, looking at um, uh, out of you know out of hospital, you know, clinics, you know, things that are office visits. But the other thing too, in terms of I think part of this action plan is the focus on community groups and working with communities because communities can be very effective in terms of working with people in terms of preventive medicine, uh, working with uh, uh, trying to find what's the best way to get people to take care of themselves. So I think that one of the things that I see is um, more reliance on the resources of communities. And one of the things that I think that when you look at something like National Negro Health Week is that the African American community uh, might not have had the money assets to take care, monetary access to take care of themselves, but they had the passion and the commitment. And so that I think that as, you know, and I agree with Dr. Kirch that, you know, we can't, we can't keep doing what we are doing. And one of the things that's also happening uh, in terms of racial and ethnic disparities is that this is the first time that the business community has started to get involved. And I think the business community has started to get involved more because in this country, getting, getting health insurance is usually a benefit of employment. And so that the companies are paying for these rate for you know these uh, for racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare in terms of lost days in terms of higher uh, premiums. So they're starting to get involved in this, and so that I think is one way of trying to stop this from imploding. I think it will implode, but uh, in terms of making sure that some changes are made in terms of looking at groups of people, because the other thing we have to face it that this country is becoming more and more multicultural. And so we're going to have to, you know, address these racial and ethnic disparities if we are going to, you know, sus you know sustain ourselves. 
Um, concerning the um, study done with the physicians and the eight patients, were the physicians all of different races and ethnicities? And did that study show, um, or any other studies done to show that uh, physicians of other ethnicities or race besides white had the same differences in treatment towards white people or other ethnic mm -hmm. In this study, they, they there weren't enough to uh, uh, to do that analysis. That you know, they they only had a smattering of of, of black uh, physicians. Um, there have been some other studies that have done it similarly, and they found that white male physicians um, were were uh, ones that. Uh, made the inappropriate treatment choice. But then there's some other studies that have looked at patient satisfaction and that there's there's conflicting data in terms of patient satisfaction in terms of a patient feeling more comfortable or satisfied with a visit from a pa from a physician who is of the same race as they. The same way that some studies have been done about women wanting to have a, you know a, a, you know a, a woman uh, a physician. There are and there also have been some some studies that uh, have looked at issues around poverty in terms of how pa you know physicians, white and black physicians, aren't as comfortable treating patients who might be poor. We'll take one last question. Quick questions. Hi. Where are you? I'm right oh, here. OK. Thanks for coming. Sure, thank you. Uh, I have a question to try to blend the science fiction that perhaps bioethics has been too focused on and uh, the social justice issue, issues that you've been bringing up. Um, the question of uh, genetic testing and, uh, and uh, abortions based not off of of uh, reasons that are more commonly accepted as reasonable, uh, forgive the term, uh, but uh, reasons of race or disability or reasons of more uh, consumer designer baby culture rather than for, again, the reasonable concerns. I was curious if you could speak on that. I mean, I think I'd have a problem answering because the word, use of the word reasonable. Okay. And that you know, in, in terms of a, a relationship with a woman and her physician, and maybe her her clergyman, you know, th that that will determine what, or in her husband or partner, will determine what they see as reasonable. So I would, you know, you know, I, I would, I just have a hard time answering. Okay. Would you would you consider it a point of necessary advocacy? If one of the things I didn't hear in there was the word voluntary. Uh, and the reason why I say that, because if you look at the history of, say, African Americans and uh, reproduction in this country, that there's this, been this ambivalence of black women towards issues around abortion and issues around uh, reproduction and, and contraception because that for so many years that people felt that it was uh, it was part of genocide in the black community to 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 get rid of the black community. So that that I, I think that if you look at the whole history of this, that uh, especially when it was done by the state, the eugenics movements in terms of not just black women but poor women, that that wasn't that was not the decision of the woman, but the decision of the state. So when you start getting to that, to that, I think that is 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 you know is is totally you know uh, uh, different, and that you know that that the issues around abortion, I believe, are you know are personal choices. And so, uh, you know, really personal choices. I guess on the last question, but oh, where? Okay, oh, I just had a question. I know you didn't comment too much on your medical degree, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to know how that helped with you in terms of focusing on public health and the sociological aspects of what you're doing, especially with bioethics. Um, when I 
when I was an undergraduate, my major, I went to school, we didn't have majors, we had concentrations. Uh, I went to Hampshire College, which is in Amherst, Massachusetts. And I did something, I did, I knew, I've been, I've been knowing since I was six years old that I wanted to be a physician. What I learned in college, I wanted to look at things in a broader social context. So I did my, uh, my concentration in medical sociology and human biology. Uh, I'm going to be talking later about the syphilis study at Tuskegee. And I did my senior thesis on that. And I've, so I've been milking that for several, like close to, I don't want to say how many years now. Um, um, <laughs> two or three, that's right. Two, uh, and because for me, I wanted to be a physician. But at the same time, growing up in West Philly, I knew it wasn't just about the practice of medicine, but it was about the social factors. And uh, so I was very fortunate to go to the University of Pennsylvania, where I could do an MD and a PhD together, and the PhD being in the history and sociology of science, and more importantly, the government and the National Institutes of Health paid for it. Um, and that I don't practice anymore, and that's because I do like to sleep every now and then, um, that, that I think that my strength was in terms of doing research and social science research and not in seeing, seeing patients. But I, I mean, it's been several years now since I've seen patients, but every now and then I do miss that interaction and the privilege of coming into someone's life in a very special and intimate way. We have to end now, but thank you for a great set of questions, and please join me in thanking Dr. Jeff.